There's all this talk about personalized medicine, and uh, we are talking about one subset of vegetarian foods. And the question is, can we go on to personalize this? And I want to do, I want to open up this space and open up the debate and to show that there may be surprises. And I hope I can convey this in the next uh, few slides, where those surprises are and uh, how we have to prepare for this. If we uh, step back for a minute and uh, look at what the last speaker's recommendations where we can try and find a bridge between these two. The last speaker says, don't blame the patient. Very true, but how does this damn thing happen? You know, how do you get disease? How does it happen? Over-reliance on two Ds. Uh, the previous uh, speaker talked about over-reliance on diet, and I'm going to say over-reliance on DNA. We sometimes say, we can answer everything with DNA. Maybe it's not going to be so easy. Uh, introspection for changing attitudes. I'll touch on that a little bit. And how does it work? How do these questions from the floor, how does this work? How do plant diets work? And we'll see if plant diets really help or there are other factors involved and supplements and cancer and therapeutic diets and all these things. Maybe there is something more and whether we can understand this. And I'm going to use the, the term up there, which is the power of the genome, the unleashed power of the genome. This is what has happened in the last 10 years. Genome is everything, you know. You can decode your genome and you can understand everything. Uh, it has changed everything. And I put a comment there on the bottom saying, uh, is this the pointer? Yes. It says, be a good thing to buy your genome sequence, which you can get for not too many dollars these days. You can get it in six hours or 12 hours or less than a week or less. And uh, there are all kinds of secrets there, but do we have the time to read this? And this is a very cheeky comment made by a German philosopher called the master of pessimistic philosophy. Is this really a pessimistic comment or is there some truth to it? Is there, the comment I put there is the man is a meta-organism. Man, as we understand today, maybe there is something wrong in the way we appreciate ourselves. You know, we still see ourselves as an object with hands and legs and organs. Maybe it's not quite right. Maybe we need to look at ourselves as something different, as a meta-organism, a collection of cells living as a community. And I'll try to come to that and see if that will give us the clarity of the new thinking that we need, the new kind of thinking. And the main theme for this new kind of thinking, I'm going to come back to this German gentleman who's a lovely man who's giving us constant insights. He says, maybe we should view the human body as just something that we are passing through. We are just passing through. That's it. It's a transience. And uh, um, Schopenhauer gives this very nicely in his comment here. I'm sure there are many in the audience who love this man. I love this man because he makes very mm, targeted comments. He says, look at it as just a transient phase. You are, after your death, what you will be before you were. And I think this is a lovely way to look at the, start to look at the body as this dynamic entity. And then we'll see how it builds up to become the organism. Now, I put another comment here, which is also very relevant to this discussion here about uh, the problems of disease. That nature is constantly telling us something, which is listen to nature. We can't improve on it. We have to listen to what nature is trying to tell you. And one of the important things it's saying is passing through, things are passing through. There are different ways. If you go down this path of understanding what we mean by passing through, there are many perspectives and many interpretations for passing through. And I just want to sketch a few of this, just to sketch to show you what passing through means to different people. And this is one instance of passing through. I'm just passing through this place for six days. And at the end of it, I get a little restaurant kind of bill. I've been here six days. Came in with a problem for an operation. I get a bill for $55,000 passing through. 
uh, uh, things that we think we can try and avoid using following a diet. Uh, very expensive way of looking at passing through. And a comment made again by uh, this lovely gentleman that the doctor of the future will give no medication but will instruct his patients in the care of the human frame, diet, and the costs and prevention of disease. There is another way to look at passing through, which is this way, which is what this essence of this conference is all about. The whole world is passing through our GI tract. Yes. You can visualize your body as a little tube from the mouth to the anus, and the whole world is running through you. And the cleverness of the body just selects what is needed. And where is this cleverness and where is this intelligence in the body that decides? It's not an intelligence that comes from today. It's an intelligence that has evolved over millions of years. And that intelligence is there in your body. And this is the bit I want to touch on, and this is the theme of our event about things passing through. So the GI tract in health and disease and prevention and diet, of course, is one aspect of it. But there are surprises here. It is not all to do with the GI tract. We'll come back to this. Oops, sorry. Now, we've heard, if I distill all that we'll, we will hear over the next day or two, we'll, it will distill into this, that the GI tract has other residents in it. There are many other things that are sitting there in the GI tract. We are genes plus proteins, but there are other guys who are there. They are much more in terms of total number of cells. They may outnumber our cells by 500 times in a healthy human being. These things are changing every day. If your bowel movements are regular, then that whole entity is moving through you every day. Depending on what you eat and what you don't eat, the numbers change. What can we learn from that? Now, uh, I've copied here the complexities that we have to face. Now, this is uh, address the question by the lady, the first question from the last session. How does this happen? How do things happen? How do you, how do you end up with disease? Is it going to be very simple uh, in, to understand? Is it purely a problem with the liver? Or is it the entire biochemistry between these two dynamic structures, the body that is evolving and the GI tract microflora that's evolving? The total amount of biochemistry that is happening in your body is multiple times more by being done by your intestinal microflora than your liver, for instance. Every day there is more biochemistry happening in your GI tract. Your bacteria are doing more things than what your liver is doing. How do we go about understanding this? So this paper, a very recent paper from, I put this paper up for a very special reason. If you look at it, uh, it comes from the Institute of Military Preventive Medicine in China. Now, they have large initiatives. They were the, this was the initiative that gave rise to this year's Nobel Prize, the Artemis in story. It was initiatives of this kind that gave rise. I won't go into the biochemistry and the fine details. It's all for you to see how the liver and the intestinal microflora interacts to give, give rise to certain uh, byproducts that cause problems in the body. But I just want to go down this path about microbes and touch on the next, next theme, which is the complexity of this ecosystem. It is a very complex system. The cells which are not us. So imagine the human body, there are cells that are us, and there are 100 to 500 times non-us cells. The question is who is host and who is guest? <laughs> These are the kind of questions that we have to handle. Yes, who is working on whom? Who is running on the back of whom? And this is the complexity we have to handle. This was uh, from a special issue of the scientist two years ago, August 2014. And they've carried on to uh, touch on many aspects of the human body's ecosystem. 
This is the complexity that we have here. The maternal microbiome, the healthy vaginal microbiome, the ocular microbiome, microbiome in the mouth, the penis microbiome, the lung microbiome, microbiome of the skin. These are all places that are rich with microbes. And these microbes are telling you something. They're telling you we are ancient residents of this body. We've been here longer than you were born. We've, been, we've evolved with you. We can teach you something about yourself. We can teach you about your biochemistry, your life, what is going on within you, even before you realize, even before the best doctor realizes. And I will give you some evidence for this. These articles are worth reading. There are large research programs now touching on all these aspects. And the American Cancer Society meeting concluded on the 20th. On the 19th, uh, this lovely lady presented some data which shocked a lot of people. She says, if you look at your mouth microflora, oral microflora, you see these two bacteria in there. They all have genomes, they all have genes. So I'm sticking to my genome theme. Now, in 50% of patients with pancreatic cancer, you see a higher number of these two bacteria. Are we missing a story somewhere? And I think we are. The overemphasis on visualizing this body and it's working and not worrying too much about other things. It is teaching us a lot, we are missing something. The logic, as it stands now, it could be refined over the coming years, is that these two bacteria are telling you about inflammation happening in other parts of the body. There is inflammation going on somewhere else, and you can read it in your oral microflora. The ratios of things in your microflora is indicating inflammation that's going on in your prostate. Now, this is very exciting. It's the reflection of this community dialogue that has been happening for millions and millions and millions of years, and they have learned how to talk to each other. And we are just waking up to this possibility of how to, how to decipher this information. Are there other actors in this story? And it seems like there are. There are even finer entities that we can score, that we can mine, that we can get information out about. And this is what you would find routinely in our oral cavity. There are billions of bacteria, and we suspect there may be over 700 different species residing here in your mouth. And they're all indicators of general health in other parts of the body, how the system is held together, how the system changes, and how it works in, in, in its entirety. And I want to touch briefly on one of the uh, bacteria that is found in the mouth. Uh, surprise was that it's an archaebacteria. It is not one of the regular bacteria. It's an archaebacteria. Archaea were identified initially as bacteria that live in extreme conditions, 500 degrees Celsius or 100,000 degrees Celsius down in the bottom of the sea. It's there in your mouth. And these bacteria locate in areas to trigger inflammation, to cause the early inflammation. Even before you start to sense it, they're doing things there. The process by which they do this is still to be understood. So if we go back in here, we find that it varies from different populations. Uh, when we look across the globe, the frequency of occurrence is variable. Is there a genetic basis for this? We don't know. I don't think so. I think it is something else that is that it's trying to tell us. The other surprise, if you look at the sera of these pa people who have this inflammation, not everybody carries antibodies to this, which is a mystery. Why not everybody generate antibody response? We don't know. 
So it might seem that much of what we are talking about in genomics, the big D, diet of one, the second D, is beyond reach. I don't think we will get there so quickly. But is there a way out? Maybe there is a way out. I'll just touch on it at the very end. So the detail, I want to spend just a few seconds on the detail. How does this bacteria, what does it do there? These uh, bacteria that generate hydrogen and utilize hydrogen, they form relationships with other bacteria and they start to form a community there. Even before we sense it, they're doing interesting things there. And this is a complex community within our bodies, which is part of a larger community. So, as I approach the very last slide of my presentation, I want to point this out, which is the unleashed power of the genome has changed everything except our thinking. There is a big problem. The first human genome was sequenced not long ago, less, a little over a decade ago, and we were all excited that this will give answers to everything. And it did give us new tools, it has opened up new areas, but there is a major difficulty. We have to learn to think about this and we have to learn how to use this data. This comment was made by Albert Einstein at the time when the uh, early issues about nuclear power were made. And we can see the same comment repeats here, the same thinking repeats here in that we need, we need a change of our, we need to rethink how we think. And for this, venues like this are very important. We need to get together to discuss these things, not just read the genome. I finish off here with this lovely story of a man. Uh, the DNA ladders are at the bottom of his feet. The much talked about DNA ladders, trying to look over the wall to see what's on the other side. The ladders that he had are not very useful there to get across this big wall. Uh, we need a complete rethink on how we go about doing things. I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madame Tangavi.